Okay, so hi folks, uh, welcome to our webinar on asynchronous GPU programming in OpenMP. So for the next about 45 minutes or so, this will be our topic. And I have an agenda slide, which you will see after the click. Thank you, Michael. Um, so we will start uh, with basically a few sentences on the two speakers here in order to keep it a little bit interesting. Yeah, we will switch back and forth between Michael and myself. And after that, we will briefly review the OpenMP device and execution model just to make sure that every one of us is using the same terms, the same terms for the same things. Uh, Michael will give you an overview about offloading in OpenMP in general. I will talk about optimizing data transfer and the support for asynchronous offloading. And uh, Michael will talk about how OpenMP will integrate with SIP or maybe even CUDA, yeah, if you dare to program with it. And finally, we will put everything together to make sure that we have um, asynchronous uh, uh, GPU programming with OpenMP interacting with other asynchronous programming models, be it uh, HIP, be it MPI, or be it everything else. And uh, we call that advanced task um, synchronization. So that's the outline. Who are we? Another click, please. So. Michael yeah, comes with two heads here. He's a principal member of technical staff at AMD. So I, I don't know what a principal member is, but my impression is he knows what he's talking about since he's working in HPC since about 2003. And uh, since about, what is it, 2009? Thanks for putting that on the slide, Mike. He's also active in OpenMP. So there's his language committee, which is designing the next release of the standard and there's the so-called ARB, the Architecture Review Board the, that owns the standard and Microsoft, uh, and Michael, sorry, is our um, uh, fearless CEO of this whole uh, organization. However, in order to make uh, a living out of his expertise, he is working on the Fortran OpenMP compilers at AMD, uh, producing code for um, using OpenMP and other program models for those mighty AMD GPUs. Thank you. Sounds about right. Uh, so Christian, he's working at Aachen University, RWDH Aachen University, and he's actually leading the HPC group. And I must say, after you took the job, it's less, a lot less fun to work with you because you're really stuck in work. Um, he does a lot of research on uh, parallel programming and performance, and that, that's why uh, we are both talking to you. He actually joined the OpenMP Language Committee one a uh, year earlier than I did. So, yes. but still, you know, we are kind of long timers. And for a pretty long time in that, in those more than uh, 10 years, uh, he was the co chair. Well, he was chair and now is co chair of the Affinity Subcommittee. So he's working on making OpenMP available on numerous systems and making sure that we can bind computation to where the data is. And he's also, uh, are you making a living out of this? Probably not. It pays it, it no. pays for his lunches. So he's co-author of the book Using OpenMP: The Next Step. It's an a fabulous book. I read it uh, first page to last page. Um, it's very cool. It's a very good uh, not only introduction but also advanced book uh, published by MIT Press. So it's worth buying it and buying Le Christian a lunch. All right, back to you. It doesn't pay for lunch. Only for beer if I pay when we meet. <laughs> All right, there you okay, go. Okay, let's continue, Mike. So, review of, of the OpenMP device and execution model. So, let's uh, zoom out a little bit and see what we are talking about. OpenMP introduced support for accelerators many years ago. And you see it on the slide as a hint. So, we were talking about accelerators and coprocessors. So, there was a special company making use of uh, coprocessors at that time. And maybe just uh, to interrupt the message to burn, there's a comment in the uh, chat that someone is not seeing the slides. Uh, let me continue until I get uh, interrupted. Uh, so accelerators, coprocessors, these were primarily, or these currently are primarily GPU devices, but uh, uh, OpenMP in principle also supported DSPs and many other devices. And later on, when you see uh, the terminology, yeah, you hopefully will understand 
that what we did is not specifically tailored to GPUs or however, this is our primary um, market. Nevertheless, OpenMP comes from way earlier than uh, introducing support for accelerators. So we have a host, uh, which is typically equipped, as you can see here, with two sockets, but of course only one sockets, but at the end of the day, regular processors, standard cores, main memory, as you would know it. And um, we can have one or multiple accelerators of the same kind to which OpenMP supports the offloading of compute kernels and data. So that means the accelerators, yeah, if there are multiple ones, are attached to the host. And I believe on the next slide, we have a nice illustration for that. Yeah, um, OpenMP talks about uh, regions in which we manage uh, the execution of code um, as a team of threads on um, uh, devices, in the case of accelerators, or in which data is being managed. What you can see here in the uh, lower third of the slide on the left side is a fancy illustration of the host. So we have a chunk of data referred to as A with some existing value, yeah, that's important. And also a physical address, um, which is zero X and uh, so forth. And uh, then at some point we might encounter some OpenMP code, including the so-called target construct, which is the main vehicle to make use of those accelerators. As you will see, again, in the review, the target construct is responsible for the offloading of both the data, uh, that means for the managing the data in the offloading process and starting the kernel on the device. So in C and C++ code, we have Pragma OP target with curly braces. This, I believe, is our only Fortran example uh, here. That means we have a begin and an end of the target construct. So at the opening curly brace in C and C++ or the uh, OMP target construct, as you can see it here, the data environment is being uh, created on the device. And at the end, the data environment is being destroyed unless we implement some of the mechanisms that we will talk about later on. So data transfers as necessarily will happen uh, again at those places. And we have a couple of data movement clauses. So these are called MAP because it may or may not be a copying. Yeah? At the end of the day, that depends on the type of device. So at least one hint that we didn't specifically design that for GPUs. In OpenMP, we map data and we can indicate the direction. So if we say alloc A, that means we want to have a variable named A, yeah? now indicated with this, uh, just blue square on the device. That means a different address. And allocation means it doesn't come with data. If we want to take this array from the host, Click mark. We can have a map clause with a two directional modifier. So that means we take the A from the host to the device um, with what, uh, yeah, with, with the example shown here. Then at some point, the interesting part is to do a kernel. Click mark. Yeah, that means we call compute, whatever on the device is, is being executed. And sooner or later, uh, the offload will end. That means with the map, and the from directional modifier, we can also take the data that we need after the kernel to continue on the host with us. And I think those fancy animations illustrated it. So target is a construct responsible for managing the offloading as a whole. The map clause managing manages um, the creation of the data environment. We call it a compute kernel and allocation and movement or copying from the host to the device happens before the kernel is started and uh, mapping from the device back to the host happens after uh, the kernel has ended and everything um, that can happen in between will be discussed in a little bit more detail when we look at more complex aspects a little bit later on. Click. All right, so I'm taking over now for explaining how to do the, the offloading. And for that, I have a little canned example. Um, it's Saxby, so one of the uh, well-known kernels that we find rather frequently in HPC applications. It's uh, probably one of the seven dwarfs even. Um, and so the black part, that's the main loop of the uh, Saxby computation. And then the green part around that, that's just a little bit of timing code that I added so that it becomes a little bit of a micro benchmark. 
And so with what Christian has told you uh, a few minutes ago, uh, all you need to do to get the for loop over to a GPU, and we're going to uh, stick to GPUs for the, for the purpose of this webinar, is you prefix the loop with pragma omp target. Um, and that is basically telling the compiler to produce code to run the black kernel on the GPU. And I'll refine that example. I, I take it it's not the real Saxby yet because it's uh, the arguments are not coming in uh, as function arguments. We'll fix that. What I also gave you because AMD is paying my, my living, I basically gave you the clan command line to translate this uh, for M AMD instinct uh, MI200 GPUs. For other GPUs, it will look very uh, similar. So basically you turn on OpenMP with dash F OpenMP. That's what you would do for any OpenMP application anyways. And then to enable offloading, you give the compiler dash dash offload arc, and then you pick the GPU you want to compile for. Uh, Client has documentation on which architectures it support and what kind of string you have to put there uh, to make it work for your GPU. And then what happens at runtime is actually this. So we have the host thread executing uh, the host region. So that means it will enter Saxby. It will execute the first part of the green code. And then once it steps on pragma on target, it will offload uh, to the GPU. We'll run the kernel over at the GPU. And once the kernel is finished, the host thread will take over again and run the remainder of the Saxby function. Now, Christian has told you uh, about the map clauses already. So we need to figure out how to move data around in the system between host memory and GPU memory if we have to. So what the compiler is required to do as per the OpenMP specification is it looks at the visible variables inside the kernel region. It identifies all the used data. It finds the definition of this data. So in this case, I'm marking that for Y. So it will look at the Y axis. It will see that it, uh, it is being used as kind of an array. It will find the corresponding de definition outside the function. And then what the compiler will do is it will kind of add a map clause for you, an implicit map clause to bring Y over from host memory to GPU memory, run the kernel using that buffer and bring it back. And it will do that for all the variables. So the same will be done for X and pretty much also A, even though there we have a slight optimization that I'll uh, explain in a minute. Uh, so for A, uh, the optimization we did is when you look at, at codes uh, that are out there, um, A, scalers are, more or less invariants like loop bounds or are used as temporaries. And so when we designed OpenMP, we figured that bringing uh, scalars over is a good thing, but bringing them back is not necessary in almost all cases. If you need that, you can overwrite the, the behavior of the uh, compiler and bring back the value. And we have a bunch of same defaults depending on which clauses you, you use uh, for, for your offload kernels. Okay, so the other observation that you may make is that copying back uh, the X array is not really necessary. It wasn't changed on the target device. We are not requiring this to happen. Uh, it was always a map to from because that's the safest thing that the OpenMP can, compiler can do. If you don't want the copy to come back, uh, it's, uh, you can add the map clause yourself to influence the decision the compiler is making here. All right, and then I put the map clause in quotation marks. Uh, we'll pick that up later in the webinar. Uh, this is actually only a presence check that the compiler add, it adds. It's not a full map clause. Um, so it will only transfer the data if it hasn't been allocated on the device yet. So far, this is kind of a future looking reference, uh, but we will, we will show you as part of this webinar how you can uh, um, widen the scope of your data environment so that it's not bound to a single kernel, but can span multiple kernel invocations. All right. So here I'm adding the map clauses kind of explicitly, and this is the optimization uh, that we wanted to make. So we bring X over from the host, we don't bring it back, and we bring over Y to run the kernel and bring the updated Y array back from the GPU. And for A, we didn't have to change the default. Uh, now, if you modify this example to be the real Saxby, where A is coming in as a parameter and X and Y are coming in as pointers, uh, the compiler will not be able to automatically infer the size of the memory behind a pointer. Uh, C and C++ uh, don't have the notion of array descriptors or the likes. 
uh, uh, that are that the compiler could rely on to figure that out. So in those cases, you will have to be explicit and tell the compiler how much data it has to transfer at runtime so that it transfers all of the X and all of the Y array. So there the compiler actually needs your help uh, because it will not be able to figure that out automatically uh, due to the lack of information in the type system. All right, so, so far, um, what we did was um, that we uh, transferred control synchronously. So that means the host thread is actually awaiting GPU execution and will only continue once that is done. You may know from other programming models like HIP, Circle, OpenCL, and for so forth, that kernel invocations are done asynchronously. In OpenMP, we decided to make uh, those uh, synchronous by default. And then you, we, we will show you later in the webinar how you can make them asynchronous and run them concurrently to host execution. Uh, the transfer of control also is sequential. So on the previous slide, the loop was not paralyzed on the GPU. This was running on a single GPU thread. And this is also intentional. Um, when you look at OpenMP and when, when Christian said we, only, we need, not only had GPUs in mind, but also other accelerators, for instance, DSPs, which have a completely different mode of operation, uh, we couldn't have the OpenMP target uh, directives also do the parallelization. So what we did is we separated the concern of data movement and movement of control flow from the actual parallelization directives. And basically now you can combine the GPU offload directives and what we have in OpenMP parallelization to create parallel regions on the target device, depending on which target device you have. So in theory, you can combine that with any OpenMP construct. In reality, there's uh, you know like a, a, a certain set of OpenMP constructs that are relevant for say something like a GPU. All right, so let me let me show you how you could in theory, do that with Saxby. So, you know, the, the blue part, that is what we talked about. We move data and we move control flow. And then we have parallel for SIMD to basically now launch uh, a team of threads and execute the loop in parallel using SIMD instructions. Now, the, the problem is GPUs are multi-level devices, even more so than uh, regular processors. So they are organized in the equivalent of thread blocks, depending on which vendor you talk about, they have different terms here. Uh, so thread blocks, those thread blocks are organized in threads and then threads may or may not be uh, capable of executing SIMD. And so the question is how we can, we can make this uh, or express this in a nice way in OpenMP. And I'm gonna show you first how it's done manually. Um, I will not spend much time on that because it's, it's cumbersome, but basically it's a standard tuning trick in HPC, it's called loop tiling. So basically we split the, the, in, the Saxby loop into an outer loop that iterates across PS for block size. And then we, we have an inner loop that iterates across one of those blocks. And then we can distribute the outer loop, which is iterating across the blocks to the wavefront in AMT terminology or warps in CUDA terminology. Um, and then assign the threads of a warp or a wavefront uh, to uh, execute on the individual tiles. Now this is a uh, basically automatic code transformation that the compiler can do for you. So we're basically uh, repeating the same color code of this slide. Uh, from the previous slide. Um, this is the way how you can express this, this multi-level parallelism with OpenMP uh, today. We also support Pragma OMP target loop, which kind of is the descriptive version of this, much shorter to type. Um, and the compiler will also, at least for, for AMD's case, our compilers will translate target loops, uh, target loop into that team's distributed parallel for simply to make use of um, a multiple uh, hierarchy, um, am I instinct? All right, Chris. Oops. So, uh, as promised, yeah, now we uh, completed our review and will add uh, complexity over time. Click, Mike. Optimizing data transfers is key, performance, key to performance. I believe you have heard that uh, before. So um, the figure tries to illustrate that the connection between the host and the accelerator, however sophisticated it may be, 
is always a bottleneck. Yeah? That means bandwidth is lower than the bandwidth from the GPU to the GPU memory, the host to the host memory, um, or whatever you might want uh, to measure. Yeah? So it, it will and is a bottleneck. Uh, putting names onto slides is uh, challenging because there's a wide variety of hardware. If you come back to that video in five years, yeah, it might look uh, out of date. But um, so bandwidth to host memory in the hundreds of gigabytes per second, bandwidth to the accelerator memory, maybe in the terabytes or is in the terabytes of seconds. If you look at uh, the admittedly old PCI Express generation four bandwidth, we are in the tens of gigabytes of seconds. Yeah? So we're talking orders of magnitudes and avoiding this bottleneck is crucial for performance. However, yeah, every offload needs some data, needs a compute kernel. So what can we do? Well, we can minimize the transfer. That means we do not have to transfer data that is not necessary on the device. Yeah? That means, for example, at the end of a compute kernel, we do not have to um, return every uh, uh, copy everything back from the device to the host, only the result. And if we are going to reuse data on the device later on, and don't, do not need the device memory for something else in between, we can leave the data there yeah, to important optimizations. More on that, click on the next slide. How can we do that? Um, so in OpenMP, we have the target construct and we can extend that to a so-called target data region. Yeah? So do I have a pointer here? Not sure if you can see it. In the left code example, the target data is important. So it's a new construct that ranges from the um, yeah, first opening curly brace after the red lines to the first closing curly brace. And what you can see here is that we have uh, a function called zeros. We have compute kernel one, SACSP, compute kernel two, and another SACSP. On the right hand side, you can see zeros and SACSP. So there we have target teams distribute parallel four, as just explained. So these are kernels executed on the device. And that uh, means if we now go back to the left hand side of the example, the target data region at the opening curly brace establishes a data environment. As explained before, it allocates TMP on the device, maps or copies A and B from the host to the device then executes zeros on the host, compute kernel one on the device. No, no, I don't, yes, compute kernel one on the device, SACSP on the device, or zero is not on the host, sorry. Zeros, compute kernel one, SACSP, compute kernel two, and SACSP all on the device. Yeah? That means multiple API calls, but A and B and also T and P are and remain on the device. Then we reach a end of the target region indicated by the curly closing curly brace. And then C is mapped back from the device to the host. Just one um, addition. So to from means we map C also at the beginning of the target region and uh, um, map it back at the end of the target region. Whereas A, B, and T and P, yeah, could technically remain on the device in terms of value, but are be destroyed in terms of memory management. But we can do even more. Yeah? This means we have a, a structured reason if we want to have um, uh, unstructured things, or if we want to trigger um, a data movement in between, we have um, the target update construct here. Okay, thank you, Michael. Uh, let's take a look. We also have a target data region here spanning uh, the whole co uh, code. Then we have a target construct with a parallel four doing some computation on the device. Uh, let's assume we update the input array on the host. I guess the name of this function is really telling. And that means we have to send an update uh, of that array, or maybe even only a subset, a slice of the array yeah, from the host to the device. This is what we have the target update for. So it sends input from the host to the device. Yeah? That means if we have an updated um, value on the host, we can send it in uh, while the target data region uh, exists from the host to the device and then call the final computation again on the device. Final example, I believe. Yeah. Um, let's uh, put things together. Yeah. So this is the first time we finally mentioned the uh, asynchronous, yeah, the theme of the uh, webinar, but uh, don't worry, there will be more. Um, Michael said the target um, calls or the target 
constructs are synchronous by default. That means the ho ho uh, ho host pauses the execution. Marketing would say it can save energy, uh, but that basically means you leave your host idle, whereas the GPU is really busy. You might be happy with it, but typically you might also want to use the host, maybe to use uh, also offload data uh, and kernels to the other device or do something meaningful in between. And um, one of the reasons why I like OpenMP is that it integrates many different um, concepts. So you might know, and I hope you know, that in OpenMP we also have tasks, which are kind of asynchronous um, computations as all the tasks are independent from the other uh, tasks. So we can make a target construct asynchronous by adding, yeah, you can see it here in this kind of darker blue, blue the so-called no wait clause which will make that a task. Yeah? That means this target, the offload of compute one inclusive, uh, inclusive the management of the data environment will now be executed asynchronously from the host. So it will be offloaded and then the host continues even before compute one has been completed. Then we have compute three and compute four in the same way. However, yeah, if we do asynchronous programming, things become a little bit more tricky. Let's take a look at the code a little bit closer. So we have a uh, host task denoted with OMP task uh, saying init data A, compute one needs A, compute three needs, uh, what do we have? B, Z and um, N is a dimension. Compute four also needs other variables. So um, we might end up, yeah, for example, if you look at compute one and four, that we have a dependency, uh, for instance, in the variable x. Yeah? Compute one produces something, yeah? compute x brings it back from the device to the host, and compute four apparently needs um, x yeah? or has it uh, on the device. So we have dependencies between the tasks and Michael, click. Yeah? Uh, we already have a feature like that in OpenMP. So if we do not want, yeah, for correctness reasons, all the tasks to run fully in parallel, we can make use of the task dependency uh, feature. And this is uh, modeled in the way the data flow in Open or the data flow can be expressed. That's a term I like to use when explaining this feature. And there's been an uh, OpenMP webinar on that uh, in POP2. So uh, init data has an out dependency on the variable A. That means it produces A, yeah? it delivers A. This is how you can think of it. Um, compute one consumes A, so it has an input independency and produces X. It has an output dependency. Yeah, that means it provides a value in X. Then we have compute three and dependency in um, output dependency in Y and compute four with an input uh, dependency in X and Y, that means it consumes X and Y. That means if a task with an out dependency has been previously uh, created, the following task with an independency may not execute before that previous uh, task has been completed because that previous task has to produce the value denoted in the um, out dependency. Yeah? This is uh, shown on the right hand side. Compute one has to wait for uh, init data. Yeah? The name, I, I think, uh, gives it away, but I hope that um, makes sense. But also, if we have two out dependencies, uh, two tasks with out dependencies, the order will be preserved. Yeah? That means uh, the previously created task will have to complete uh, before because it's producing data, which the other would override. Hence my uh, reference to the data flow. So to summarize that, yeah. At the end here, we have a task wait. Thanks for the final animation. Um, as a, a no wait makes a task, sorry, no wait makes a target asynchronous by making it into a task. And we have can uh, and we can have dependencies expressed on the host between the tasks to introduce an order if that is necessary for correctness. It was the first explanation of asynchronicity. Now we need some more interaction with GPU models to finally come back to that topic. And I hand over to Mike. All right, thanks. So um, the next chapter in this is in this webinar is how to make OpenMP talk to a lower level programming model like HIP or CUDA if you uh, prefer NVIDIA GPUs. Um, and so the, what we support 
in OpenMP is actually a whole bunch of interactions. So the first one is uh, that you can call low level kernels written in HIP or CUDA uh, from OpenMP application code. So that means all your buffer management, all your high level logic is uh, done in OpenMP using directives or the explicit APIs that we have there. Um, and then you call um, a low level kernel from these contexts uh, as sort of a performance optimization. We also support the other way around. So if you have written uh, a vast majority of your application in HIP already, uh, we can uh, offer that you can call OpenMP kernels passing in HIP uh, pointers uh, or GPU pointers and make OpenMP understand those. And what we don't present today, and I don't actually have it on the slide, but I'm going to mention it real quick, is that we also support uh, querying the underlying execution mechanism for the stream object. So as you know, HIP kernels are executing on a stream, uh, same for OpenCL, CUDA, and circle and so forth. And OpenMP has a mechanism to get a handle to that stream object so that when you want to invoke libraries like Rockblas or Kuplas, uh, you can do this uh, using the stream object that you got from the OpenMP implementation so that you can uh, you know, interact nicely with the underlying um, execution mechanisms. All right, and since XP is kind of the running example, so let's assume I wrote this uh, little code uh, kind of resembling what we had as, um, as a sequence of compute kernels already. And you know, the, the SACSP version that we have in here is pretty much what, um, what we've been showing to you a whole bunch of times already. And now let's assume just for a second that the OpenMP compiler is not providing you with the right level of performance, or you want to map that kernel to the GPU in a very special way by using you know, some low level uh, functionality that is not really accessible from a high level language like uh, C, Fortran, including OpenMP. So let's assume we want to rewrite that thing in uh, the low level language HIP. So here's, here's how that looks like. Um, so here you see two functions. Uh, the first one up there, that's the un double under, global double under, void SACSP kernel. That's the actual kernel that we compile for the GPU. And it basically resembles this notion of this kind of grid-based programming that you know from, uh, from HIP and OpenCL. So basically we uh, decide that at the, uh, the ith iteration of the kernel is pretty much thread IDX plus block IDX and the block dim in that X direction, that gives us the, the location in the, um, in the grid where we want to evaluate that, I'm tempted to call it a stencil, but it, it is not really, but where we want to in, in, um, uh, invoke that kernel on. And so for that place, we describe what the effect of the kernel should be. And then we instantiate that uh, as many times as we need. The lower function SEP SACSP hip, that's the one that actually has the tremble in to, act, to, to invoke the kernel. Uh, so it uses the travel, triple chevron syntax. We decide to have a block size or block dim of 256 uh, threads per block. And then obviously we need n divided by 256 uh, blocks to cover all of the SACSP iteration space. And for the sake of keeping this simple, I assume that you know n evenly divides 256. Now, the one thing that we will recognize here is that these entities are device pointers. So when you talk to a hip kernel, you cannot pass an arbitrary pointer to it. It has to be a valid uh, pointer that you got from something like hip malloc or equivalent memory allocation functions that allocate a piece of memory inside the GPU memory space. Um, so how can, we, how can we tell OpenMP uh, to get these device pointers? Now let's, for that, we have to look at how pointer translation actually works in OpenMP. And we've been showing this slide already to introduce the, uh, the execution model. So say in host memory, we have an entity called X at a certain address A, B, C, D. So that thing that you have in your C, C++ program is a host pointer pointing to that in virtual memory address on the host. And when you dereference that in host code, it has a certain meaning and it will access the, uh, the elements of, of this array of, of this or, the, or of this memory. Now, 
when you do pragma omp uh, target data, and we're kind of mixing uh, OpenMP and Fortran here, uh, just for the fun of it. So when you do the map two, uh, what you get is if you have a discrete GPU with discrete memory, and we actually do a memory copy, uh, what you'll find is that the compiler uh, will introduce a in the device memory this, um, this buffer that Christian was talking about, and that will have a different address. And what OpenMP does for you is in a mapping table, it's a little more complicated than that, but you know, for this webinar, this is, this is uh, good enough. So in this mapping table, what OpenMP records for you is a host, the host pointer and where you can find the corresponding device entity of that, of that host pointer and, and its device pointer. Um, and so those two form now a pair so that when you have a map clause and the presence check, OpenMP not only can detect that uh, stuff or data is already on the GPU, but it also knows where to find it in the GPU memory space. And so for the hip kernel invocation, this is what we need, right? So from the host pointers, your X, we somehow need to tap into this mapping table to understand what is the device pointer that we need for invoking a hip kernel. And the way to do this in OpenMP is via a clause called use device adder for use device address. So basically it starts out with some host entity X, again, this uh, fake address. And then what you can do with the target data construct when you pass it the use device adder clause and a bit of clumsy syntax, uh, just you know, use it that way. Uh, it is. It has to do with a bunch of corner cases of the language, but basically the syntax is X and then opening uh, brackets colon zero. Um, that is the way how you to tell you tell OpenMP to get the device address out of the mapping table, and then what happens inside uh, the opening and the closing curly brace, you get a new X. So this is no longer the original host X that is pointing to the host address or the host memory. This is now an X that shadows this original X up here and the compiler fills this pointer with the actual device address. So you're still executing on the host, but now this X inside those curly braces in here has now the device address. And now you can stick that into the kernel, which I'm showing here. So basically, you know, um, this is the same thing that you saw uh, a bunch of slides ago. So now I extended this to have the proper target data mapping for X and Y, like we did before and like Christian was talking about as well. Uh, inside those curly braces, we are now having a target data environment where, uh, you know, on the device, we know that this host pointer has been allocated on this, on this device address and X is still pointing to the regular host memory. And this is where, you know, all the traditional OpenMP will work uh, like Christian was explaining already. Now, if we want to invoke the Tremblin function of the hip kernel for Saxby, what we do is we nest the OpenMP target region inside this outer one that does the data management. And now we tap into the pointer translation table by asking OpenMP, what is the device pointer for X? What is the device pointer for Y? And so inside those curly braces, you still are referring to X, but now the mapping table doesn't change, but your X has changed to now be the device pointer and it's kind of hiding the original X up here that was pointing to the host. And now you can just pass that to the Tremblin function. The Tremblin function will pass it to the hip stream. The hip stream will pass it on to the GPU, launch the kernel, and when you dereference that X on the target device, um, it will just work. All right, Christian, advanced task synchronization. You're muted. Sorry, I was muted, thanks. Yeah. So unfortunately, this is where it stops with, it just works. So it gets a little bit more complicated. I'll do my best to, to explain things, but I said earlier, Asynchronous programming yeah, may be really tricky. So we're now putting everything together. Asynchronous offloading, managing um, data, or sorry, and interacting with uh, other programming uh, models. 
not sure if if you work with uh, hip or with CUDA or whatever be before, but if you're an HPC, I think you used uh, MPI, the I send or I receive and the MPI wait. So that means, you know, asynchronous APIs, you trigger an operation and uh, you have another operation uh, to make sure that you can finally wait for that. Yeah? Similar to whatever future, yeah? there are so many different uh, instances of that. However, in, in pragma-based programming models, yeah, there are limitations as to what you can uh, express. Nevertheless, OpenMP has some support, and this is what we are going um, to discuss. Let's take a look at the source code here in the middle of the slide. Uh, it's an uh, asynchronous memory transfer from, let me see, copy device to host, yeah, from the device uh, to the host. So we do something we call hip memcopy async. Yeah, which starts a copy operation, destination source, uh, data volume, um, a stream, yeah, like a handle to do something asynchronously and to achieve an order on multiple asynchronous operations and the direction modifier. So this is started, something else can be done, like do something else. And then we have a stream synchronize, which is in my exa MPI example, the equivalent uh, to the MPI weight to make sure that we can wait for the async copy operation uh, to complete and then do something else. Now, yeah, the goal is to interact with that with also OpenMP. And we have uh, a failing example, a half of semi-functional example, and then uh, two good solutions. I have to admit, yeah, I would have come up with this try when I uh, would, uh, yeah, when, when I, yeah, this is what I've done. I yeah, started thinking about that, but I guess I might have realized uh, my issue. So the solution here or the idea here is to look at OpenMP tasks. We're looking at the same source code, do something, asynchronous copy, do something else, stream synchronize, do other important stuff. Yeah, I gave it away, the slide gave it away. This does not work. So what do we have? We have a data race between tasks A and C. Tasks are independent from the other tasks. That was my brief summary of the OpenMP tasking model. That means task C might execute concurrently or even before task A started, has been completed, and so forth. So that means uh, the synchronize would be called before the asynchronous copy. Important stuff that might depend on the result yeah, to be provided in DST, the destination. We have a data race and data races might be uh, tricky to identify. So tasks are not enough. Now yeah, you learned something about tasks open already. Let's take a look at task dependencies. Remember what kind of uh, dependencies um, we had. Yeah? For sure, we want to wait, uh, to, we want to make that task C waits for task A. So we have a data flow again, task A, yeah, provides a result in DST and task C consumes the result. So we have an out dependency on the first task. We have an in dependency on the second task yeah, in part of, uh, that's part of our uh, dependency chain. And uh, we need some variable yeah, as a handle. It can be dumb, a dummy variable. It can be the stream. It could also have been DST. Yeah? That doesn't matter. Uh, there are different solutions. We just need a shared address uh, technically to express this uh, dependency. Um, what's the issue? Maybe we can do a click again, Mike. Um, the code is correct, but we take a thread away from the execution. Yeah? So that means task C could uh, be blocked, so we don't have the um, thread um, available. So what's what are other solutions? Um, in OpenMP, we don't have tasks. We have uh, that was a bit a little bit too quick, but okay. Uh, you sort of gave it away. So what we need, yeah, because we have uh, uh, blocked the thread here. Yeah, uh, since task C is waiting, the, yeah, we want to kind of keep the task in a waiting state and be uh, or enable the application. Sorry, enable the runtime to make use of that thread. And now, Michael, yeah, so what I'm describing here is to detach the task from the thread. If that's the best word, I don't know, but I gave my best yeah, to explain 
uh, where this came from. So OpenMP5, oh, I forgot when that was released, uh, but um, Michael might remember. So it introduced the concept of detachable uh, tasks. That means a task can remain active. Yeah, That means not completed without a thread actively um, working um, on that while still enabling all the um, existing synchronization mechanisms that we uh, worked on uh, so far. So Michael just added in the chat, OpenMP5 has been released in 2018. So this is already available in implementations. Um, so we want to be able to detach a task, but uh, in order to mark the completion, yeah, we need some trigger functionality, like a signal, if you know it's thread-based, uh, synchronization. So it's not a signal, yeah, but we need some um, a signal to be sent to actually complete the task. And this is what's not available uh, in the Pragma, but this is where you have to use an API to make use of that functionality because, and we will see that later on, that might also be then finally caused from a call from another API. Yeah, So that means a callback in PIP, MPI, whatever might call this you see it at the bottom, OMP fulfill event API call. Yeah, that will signal this task, this detached task is now completed. Sounds a little bit abstract. Let's take a look at the um, so, a simple example, then come back to our uh, previous example. So we have an uh, event handle, we have um, a task with a detach uh, clause, we have a task wait. Yeah, this is our boilerplate code. We do something important. Click Mike. Yeah, what happens here? So when that detached task reaches the end of the curly brace, sorry, the task with a detached clause reaches the end of the curly brace, it will not be considered to be completed, but be, um, be detached. Yeah? That means the thread becomes available. Task will kind of dangle around in the runtime. Yeah, Mr. Implementer here can give you more details if you're interested. Let's continue, Mike. Now we have another uh, piece of code that's that's doing something, um, and uh, at some point will lead to the detached tasks to be completed. But uh, for the time being, this task wait can't be passed because the task uh, created or uh, cre yeah, created at the same level as a task wait is not completed. Click again. Somewhere else uh, in a different thread task we will uh, uh, make sure that the uh, OMP fulfill event, the API from the previous slide, will be called. And here we have to match the argument, this event, uh, between the detach clause and the API call. That means it will send this signal to actually make sure this task, find this detached task is now completed. And then step four, the task wait can uh, complete. Uh, that's the mechanism. Now let's put that back into our uh, example from before. <coughs> Sorry. Um, so we have to uh, slightly modify um, the code. We need a new function that's on top. Uh, that's in the uh, callback. I'll come to that in a second. Um, task A will be made a detachable task. Here we have this hip event, uh, or you could call it task A completion, whatever you like. It's a variable. And uh, um, the mem copy async still is an asynchronous operation. And we had a, a stream callback. So that means when the asynchronous um, callback, uh, sorry, the asynchronous copy is completed, yeah, there will be a callback that's shown on the top. The callback function will be called. And this is then uh, using OMP fulfill event to um, finally signal that this detached task A is being completed. And uh, that means task C uh, will be able uh, to start because, and I think we should have marked that blue. Now between task B and task C, we have a task wait. Yeah? And that was a, is a mechanism uh, that I used on the previous slide. Task A is detached. That means uh, uh, after the code block, the curly brace has been completed. Uh, it's uh, the task is not completed only when the hip stream add callback uh, functionality enabled, um, or the, uh, the hip stream at callback, yeah, finally called the callback function, sorry, um, uh, when the asynchronous copy has been completed, 
which then calls OMP fulfill event. Only then the task will be completed, and that means the task wait can um, uh, progress. However, that's a little bit stronger. Okay, you can click. I believe um, I said it all. So here we're waiting for task A and task B, which is not uh, yeah the ultimate solution. So we can refine that a little bit further. That means, um, and this is an ultimate asynchronous example. I believe we can work with task dependencies and uh, detachable uh, tasks. Yeah. So we have an out dependency and the detach clause, uh, back to the example that blocked the thread earlier. Uh, so here again, we use the callback. So where the asynchronous um, copy is completed, uh, the callback function that has been registered will finally call on the fulfill event. That is number two. Then the detachable task will be marked completed. Uh, we don't have a task wait. That means we don't have to wait for task B. The dependencies between task A and B are just in parentheses expressed between the out and input dependency on DSC. And I believe that's the best solution that we can come up with. Please do not continue, Mike, just one comment. Yeah. So what is OpenMP and what is HIP specific? OpenMP supports detach and OMP fulfill event. If you want to make use of CUDA, yeah, you can also add uh, callbacks into the stream. If you use MPI or asynchronous IO, yeah, this in blue is what you have to do. That means if an asynchronous operation has been completed, yeah, you have to add the callback or any other trigger mechanism to notify OMP fulfill event. And this is not a pragma, uh, that means a standalone directive or, uh, or any construct. Uh, because that, uh, that would be in many cases impossible to realize. And this is why this is an API function. Okay, that uh, I believe was our final slide. Mike, another click uh, to summarize on uh, uh, on POP. So what we what did we talk about? I think we introduced you or reviewed the OpenMP offloading concept and uh, during the course of then the, the real part of this tutorial, uh, we showed you how OpenMP supports um, efficient data management on accelerators, asynchronous offloading, how to interfere with uh, device native uh, APIs, and finally put everything together into uh, interacting with asynchronous offloads and asynchronous um, APIs. In the beginning, Burn said, "Yeah, go if you are interested, and at some point." Um, uh, if you're interested in the videos and the slide, at some point you will see it on the POP homepage. So I believe this slide is the ultimate pay pointer to POP. And with that, it's uh, close to four. I will stop talking here. Thanks for your attention, but don't run away. If you have questions in the chat or any other question, uh, this uh, soon will be the time uh, to get our answers. Any final word from you, Mike? Thank you for listening. Thank you. Christian, Michael, thank you so much for this really interesting and entertaining uh, webinar. Yeah, And as uh, Christian said, uh, if you're interested in past webinars, 25 so far have been recorded. You find them either in the YouTube channel or also on the web page. There's a, a page with a list uh, and, and pointers into the YouTube uh, videos. And also, uh, we will probably roughly every four to six weeks, we have another webinar. Uh, so all the new ones will be uh, announced on the website or you join our uh, oh yeah, uh, now X uh, account. We also have a, one on LinkedIn, uh, which I probably should add, add that on the slide, but you'll find the pointer on, on the web page. So yeah, we have a few questions. Um, let me look for the first one. <clears throat> uh, since you work on the standard, could you explain why we have the update construct? Wouldn't the compiler be able to already see that a buffer at address X has been mapped to the device before and thus update it instead of reallocate? Shall I take it? You can, yeah, you can take it. Um... I'll, I'll leave the fortunate question to you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Very much. All right. So, uh, so the thing is, um, one of the things that are also in the mapping table is a reference count. So that means OpenMP keeps track how many times you requested via map clauses or implicit presence checks that something is mapped and remains remap mapped. And so if that reference count is actually zero, 
uh, and we do the first mapping, we transfer data over. If then we increment it to some level and then at some point it will reach zero, we're gonna transfer the data back if we need to transfer. Now, once that reference count is greater than zero, um, OpenMP will not automatically reallocate the data or move data around. It will just happily say, it's there, it's done. We don't have to do anything except for maintaining the bookkeeping of the reference count. So that's why we need in this example that I think you referred to, we need the update clause to kind of manually tell OpenMP to move data from host memory into, into an existing uh, device buffer that has uh, a, a reference count higher than one. Um, one thing that uh, you may also find interesting when you look at the spec, there are also so-called map modifiers. So there's also uh, a second way how you can override this uh, mapping behavior um, and, and have uh, implement sort of corner case uh, and special case these and override the, um, the reference count mechanisms in OpenMP. Okay, Th thank you very much. So. Uh, if I understood correctly, let's say we have two kernels that use the same data, maybe a nested behavior, you, you would actually maybe you use that data map twice to increment the reference counter. So it's like automatically managed by the, uh, the compiler, I guess, uh, the internal Correct. record. Correct. Okay, it's, thanks. It's pretty much like, you know, rough comparison would be like a C++. I think it's a shared pointer that does the automatic reference counting as, yeah. Uh, yeah. by itself. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much. Okay, next question from Alexei. Uh, when OpenMP-enabled compiler translates the loop body, it probably must decide if it is okay for the paralyzing, for paralyzing the way it is requested. Not sure if this check is required by, by the OpenMP specification or not. How this diagnostic is supposed to handle poss possible point aliasing? Is there any hint as a part of OpenMP spec to declare that pointers in a loop body are not aliased and parallel code for a loop body can be generated, especially for Fortran? Yeah, so I, I, I'm neither a compiler person nor a Fortran person, but my answer would be, if you say Pragma OP parallel four, yeah, this is what the compiler um, will do. Yeah? So it will uh, generate code uh, that distribute loop iteration um, over um, individual threads. Not sure if you have a specific code um, in in mind, but the question was, do we have pointer, uh, if we have two or more pointers that possibly overlap, and uh, if that would lead to a data race or any other, issue in the case of parallel execution, you will experience what the data race is. Yeah? So the compiler will follow your order. This is what I use in my uh, tutorials. It's a little bit different when it comes to SIMD. Um, yeah, there are some uh, safeguards still in place, but if you ask for parallel four, you will get parallel four. Anything to add, Mike? Yeah, maybe if, if you want to express that two pointers are not aliasing uh, in C and sort of C++, even though it's not standardized yet, I right. believe you have the restrict keyword, which basically is a base language feature, how you can express that already in the base language. So beyond OpenMP uh, and in Fortran, things are actually a, a lot easier because dummy arguments may not alias or shall not alias in Fortran. So it's kind of safe when you have something coming into a procedure or function. Uh, if it is aliased, it's already wrong at that level and OpenMP will just um, you know, screw you over on top of that, <laughs> if you will. Um, so, you know, it is it is mostly handled in the base language, um, but OpenMP does what you ask for. So this is, uh, you need to pay attention to what you're asking for. Yeah. But regarding then uh, micro architecture optimizations, if you have non-overlapping pointers, yeah, tell the compiler either with restrict or with uh, special arguments for that particular file on the combined line, uh, there are some application cases where you can improve performance. Okay, <clears throat> then we have a question from Yannick. Since GPUs already use the SIMT model and CUDA, he's not familiar with Rockham, only has SIMD operations for 8 and 16 bit size data vectors. Why did you add the SIMD class in earlier slides, in your early examples? Okay, since I was tagged in the question, I'll, I'm going to take it. Um, so the thing is, 
Yes, you're right. For, for CUDA and also for HIP, you wouldn't need it. Uh, so pretty much when you use uh, target, Pragma, OMP, target, teams, distribute, parallel for SIMD or do SIMD if you're in Fortran, we pretty much just ignore SIMD and say, you know, we, we don't need it for, for our code chain. Uh, so we don't, we don't use it at all. There are other uh, GPU vendors though. Um, they have like a squirrely logo. Um, and their threads actually have SIMD 1, 2, 4, and 8. So in that case, you can use the SIMD clause to give the compiler more information about what is the desired SIMD width. And uh, as far as I still remember from past days, it pretty much means that if you enlarge the SIMD size by a certain factor like two, uh, that you cut your register file into half. And so you have this trade-off between instruction width and slots in the in the SIMD in the SIMD register, but for uh, Nvidia and AMD GPUs, this is just you know over specified, and we pretty much remove that that um, that part of the directive. Okay, now an interesting uh, tool question from Bramot. For the applications with complex task graphs with async execution, in your experience, which are visual tools available today to analyze the execution of task graphs to debug complex performance issues? Like some people, I don't know whether you know that, there was a, a tool, Temanejo or Intel's Flow Graph Analyzer, which showed the task graph with dependencies. And ideally, he wants to have something which ac works across vendor tool chains with OpenMP offload, of course. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, for, for my experience, yeah, with real application codes, that's uh, that's a challenge. So there's no uh, perfect solution. I would uh, try give give the two tools you mentioned a try. However, I didn't work with uh, Temanejo in 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 a while. Yeah, so I I'm not sure if it's still under uh, development and. Um, Intel's flow graph analyzer. Yeah. So we have a, pa a past member of my group is one of the developers. So we got some demos, but it also have li has limitations to put it like that. Um, so most tools have very limited ability to actually show you that. However, I would argue, do you really need the visualization of millions of tasks yeah, and how they execute? So what we typically um, uh, apply is a metric-based approach. Huh? And <laughs> now we could uh, do some marketing for POP here. Uh, so at some point, the task will synchronize at a parallel region or something like that. So we look at metrics like the efficiency, that means time and spent uh, in productive code in your application or in the uh, OpenMP runtime, at the load imbalance, at the thread level and so forth to understand if there's an uh, issue. And um, yeah, there are also uh, uh, special tools yeah, that we use to to then take a uh, closer look. Yeah, not all in in the production level, like an on the fly critical path tool uh, that we are developing and so forth. But my experience is, yeah, this is really tough uh, to look at in a very fine granular way. Also because then the overhead increases. Uh, so my recommendation would be to take a um, broader look at uh, metrics on the synchronization level and so forth. If you have a real question with a real code, yeah, POP is there to help. So we have services on the EU level. Um, the main one is called assessment. Yeah? So we can assist you in understanding what's going on in your code. But the burnt is a tool expert. Do you have anything to add on that? No, I, no? I don't know of any tool. <laughs> <laughs> Sure. I mean, like out of my head, I would say somehow try to grab the, the task dependencies and just put it into some graphing tool uh, to basically lay it out. Uh, yeah, like well, these, uh, but uh, I don't know of anyone who who basically does that for now. So it I might try. be an interesting new uh, summer student project or so, perhaps. <laughs> okay, um, so probably tried actually, it, but if you look at uh, recursive algorithms or even a simple. Sudoku example, you end up with millions of, of tasks and that's that's really hard to make sense of. Yeah? So yeah. then look at the uh, increasing time spent in the OpenMP runtime per recursion level and so forth to actually understand what to do. That's, that, yeah, that's my recommendation. 
Yeah, so Brahmot had a, has actually a second question, which oh. is not uh, related to that uh, topic, but he wants to make use of the, the opportunity to have two experts from OpenMP here. Are there any ongoing discussions or future plans to define the A API compatibility aspects for OpenMP to facilitate distributed pre-compiled applications or libraries? So you're referring to ABI, I believe, yeah? the application binary yeah. interface. Yeah, yeah. ABI, sorry. Yeah, if that would be available, I would make use of that as well. <laughs> okay, let, let me give the implementer's perspective on this. Um, likely not going to happen. Yeah. Um, the, the main reason is that OpenMP is very careful in trying to not specify implementations, but behavior aspects of it. So we basically don't say anything about how OpenMP has to be implemented. And so, you know, in former times, there was one implementation that implemented parallel execution using Cactus stack. So they basically forked a new thread and kind of, you know, reused the old stack and kind of had like a fork in the stacks and, and did it that way. Uh, today, it's mostly based on, you know, regular POSIX threading uh, and pretty much between GCC and LLVM, a very similar protocol on how you can get to uh, those additional POSIX threads and how you can map your code to those. Um, so no, we don't intentionally try to uh, specify an ABI because that would constrain implementations and would be too prescriptive in how things can be done. Uh, plus, uh, especially when we talk about GPUs, it is hard to specify something that would also work across the board of all the GPU vendors and potential future uh, uh, GPU vendors. And of course, you know, when it comes to offload model, we don't not we don't even know what we're offloading to. So, recently, uh, uh, I wrote a paper or a poster paper with uh, a bunch of uh, folks from from LRC and EPCC. Um, to basically drive a quantum computer from OpenMP offloading. Um, and so, you know, it's it will be hard to specify like a calling convention for something like a quantum circuit. So we, we intentionally stay away from this. So this is the, the theory. And then the pragmatic approach is since uh, several implementations, uh, so including AMDs, uh, are based or forked off uh, LLVM and the implementation that we have there, they are already sort of compatible. So uh, basically, if you have an upstream LLVM project built and you use a downstream uh, AOMP build for, for Rockham, uh, the underlying OpenMP runtime is pretty similar. So there is already sort of a pragmatic API by us forking um, LLVM. And there are other vendors doing the same thing. So for those, there is a, a certain chance, even though it's officially not supported, uh, to basically you know, link against one M OpenMP implementation and have a certain chance that it will work uh, with another one. OK, but this is at your own risk. OK. Uh... Yeah, Alexei added a comment saying legacy code is different. <laughs> Sometimes you have to do, you have pointers in Fortran code and sometimes you have not as come arguments and AMD compiler really takes much care of this, which false positives. Uh, yeah, uh, but I think he was answering to the question way before. Yeah. <laughs> okay, any other final questions? Um, you, okay, here's another one from uh, Rommel. When you have an application with a large number of small kernels, CUDA and HIP have a graph API that allows them to be executed in a lighter way. Is there any kind of support for OpenMP directives to be able to take advantage of them? Um, sort of. Um, so what we are doing at the moment um, is in OpenMP 6, we're working on a task graph proposal. Um, the Barcelona Supercomputing Center is the main driver behind that um, and is driving yeah. that forward. Uh, they already uh, pushed uh, some of the implementation aspects into upstream LLVM. So that's something that you can pretty much already turn on, even though the compiler support is still uh, not fully there yet. Um, so 
you know, in OpenMP, it will be possible with OpenMP6 to basically record a task graph and then replay it. And I think if you sum up one and one, um, this is why this is going to be interesting for companies like NVIDIA and AMD. Okay. Yeah. So uh, thanks again, uh, guys, for taking the time. Thank you, everyone, for the, the questions and listening so far. 